first place to start is with scripture in 1 Corinthians 12. And it's a very familiar passage of scripture. 1 Corinthians 12. In scripture, there are three different passages, depending on your own theology of where you're going to find spiritual gifts listed. 1 Corinthians 12 is one chapter. Romans 12 is another chapter. And Ephesians 4, where it talks about the fivefold ministry, there are those in the body of Christ that believe those are gifts, not roles or functions, and there are others who believe those are offices of the church. So you have to know where you stand on that. But those are the three portions of Scripture that are most often referenced in regard to the gifts of the Spirit. But 1 Corinthians 12 this morning, and I'm going to read this out of the New Living Translation. And I'm not going to read the whole chapter. I'm going to start, uh, he, he speaks in verses 1 through 11 about the various gifts in the body. And then in verse 12, he starts talking about one body with many parts. And he said, it's the same way with the body of Christ, starting at verse 13. Some of us are Jews, some are Gentiles, some are slaves, and some are free, but we've all been baptized into one body by one spirit, and we all share the same spirit. Yes, the body has many different parts, not just one part. If the foot says, I'm not part of the body because I am not a hand, that doesn't make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear says, I'm not part of the body because I'm not an eye, what would that make it any less a part of the body? If the whole body were an eye, how would you hear? Or if your whole body were an ear, how would you smell anything? But your bo our bodies have many parts and God has put each part just where he wants it. How strange a body would be if it had only one part. Yes, there are many parts, but there's only one body. The eye can never say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. In fact, some parts of the body that seem the weakest and the least important are actually the most necessary. And the parts we regard as less honorable are those that we clothe with the greatest care. So we carefully protect those parts that should not be seen, while the more honorable parts do not require this special care. So God has put the body together such that extra honor and care are given to those parts that have less dignity. That makes for harmony among the members so that all the members care for each other. If one part suffers, all the parts suffer with it. And if one part is honored, all the parts are glad. For all of you together are Christ's body and each of you is a part of it. And then he goes on to talk about the fivefold ministry and some spiritual gifts. In this room, there are people at all different levels of spiritual development and maturity. There are some unchurched baby Christians, some people who've been sitting in pews maybe for years and decades, but God wants to reveal some deeper things of scripture. So with this familiar passage of scripture in mind, we're going to look at the body of Christ, and my goal today is to help you discover your unique giftings and calling. And then when we meet in two weeks, we're going to talk about what does that look like in a five-fold ministry team, and how are you plugged into the body in a larger way and using your gifts. Unfortunately, too many churches and ministry leaders do not know how to help people discover their unique kingdom role while you're here on the earth. There was a study done that said it was more than 50% of people who have reached the age of 50 or 60 and beyond have never discovered where they fit or what God put them on the earth for. That's, a, that's horrible. That's a tragedy. Discover what God put in you and then just loose it on the earth. And then you need to find people and put them around you that can help you grow in that, develop it, and celebrate you for that. I have learned what God put me on the earth for, and I have fun with it. When you're doing what God called you to do, it's not work. But not everybody appreciates what God put in me. <laughs> I have to get, be, have people around me that celebrate what God put in me and help me be better. And that's my prayer for all of you, 
that you finally get this figured out. And the earlier you can do it in life, the greater impact you're going to have. This type of training, I do this in the secular workplace with organizations and corporate teams because far too often people get stuck in jobs that neither fulfill them nor come easily to them. How helpful would it be for everybody if we all knew our role and we were able to operate in it as opposed to being jealous of others and comparing ourselves with others and other people's role within the body of Christ. That's our, where we're going to start. I could teach you this out of my sleep. I've been doing this for two decades or more. There are people in this room who have heard this teaching ad nauseum, but I do have some additional information that people, nobody here has heard because time never allows for it. And I'll get through as much as I can this morning and then we will cover the rest of it next time. I just wanted to go through this vocabulary lesson and explain for today's purposes what the definitions of these words are. A temperament, your temperament, is the way that God knit you together in your mother's womb. It's the way you've been hardwired. It's your natural instincts and response patterns, the things that you do without ever thinking about it. Your temperament never changes from the nursery to the nursing home. You were this way as a little boy or girl, and you're gonna be this way as an old man or an old woman. It can be tempered. Your temperament can be tempered, but it will not change. People that God wired to be leaders are never going to turn into people who just sit down and shut up and never open their mouth. They're always going to have something to say, <laughs> whether anybody <laughs> wants to hear it or not. Um, a verse for temperament would be found in Jeremiah 1.5 that says to the effect of, uh, before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you, I called you, and I set you apart as a prophet to the nations. Your call was on you in your mother's womb. Your divine purpose and call. And he knit you together with everything you would need to fulfill that call. Your personality is who other people say you are. It's who you let people see, and it may or may not be the real you. It's basically the masks we wear in front of people. And some people are more adept at this than others. They just become who they're with at any given moment. Your character is who you are when nobody's looking. So if you have the opportunity to do the right thing and nobody will know, or do the wrong thing and nobody will know, which are you more apt to do? Simple example, you find yourself in Walmart on a Tuesday morning and you need to run to the restroom, and you look down and there's a $50 bill on the floor by the toilet. Are you the type of person that says, oh, it's my lucky day, and that goes in your pocket? <coughs> or do you say, somebody's lost their money for their groceries or their prescription, I better go to the service desk and see if somebody's looking for money? Those things speak to character and integrity. There's no black or white, right or wrong answer in these types of situations. It's just the things that you do in the moment. Many people will say, if push comes to shove and it was a crisis situation, of course I would do the right thing. I would do the moral thing and the thing of integrity. But you don't just summon up integrity and godly character in the moment. It's developed throughout your life with all the little decisions you make every single day. The way you treat people, the way you talk to people, that reflects your character and your integrity. Words mean little. The Bible tells us fruit speaks very loud. People know what you're like regardless of what you say you're like. And they determine that by the way you treat people and speak to people. There's a fourth word called congruence. Who knows what congruence means? If things line up, like it makes Thank sense. you. I say, if you don't remember, think about geometry. I never took geometry, but a congruent <laughs> triangle. That means something that's the same, equal on all sides. 
if you're a congruent person, you're the same across all three of these terms. So if I am a congruent person, the Nancy that you see here as a teacher, trainer, counselor, is the same Nancy you're going to run into at the grocery store on Thursday morning, mm -hmm. is the same Nancy you're going to sit next to in a bleacher at a Friday night ball game, and is the same Nancy you're going to sit beside in a pew at a church service on Sunday morning. Having said that, how many of you can say, yeah, I'm pretty congruent. Raise your hand. I'm certainly trying to be. Okay. Anybody? Okay. The vast majority of people tell me they're not. And I did this teaching with a number of pastors in Southern Maine once, and there was a pastor from uh, Midwest there, and he just started sobbing when I asked this question. And I said, why are you crying? I mean, I didn't want to put him on the spot, but I was just baffled. I was just getting started in the training, and he's already crying. <laughs> and he said, I'm not a congruent person, and I desperately want to be. There is freedom in being congruent and being who you were meant to be. And stop trying to be what you think everybody wants you to be. Or who your parents told you you should be. Or your teachers, or your coaches, or your boss. So, I'm not going to talk to you today about your personality or your character. I'm going to talk to you about your temperament. How God wired you. And this information hopefully will allow you to become more congruent. If you're not sure if you're a congruent person, go ask your family. So when I teach this, I often say to my kids who are now adults, <clears throat> but I started asking this when they were teenagers, do you think I'm congruent? Or do you think I treat people differently, depending on who I'm with? And they always said, no, you're pretty congruent. You speak the same way to clients and in the church and to the family all the same way. Now there are different levels of intimacy. That doesn't mean I'm not congruent. You might hear me tell a joke and be funny, but my kids and my family are gonna see me be silly in a way that you probably wouldn't see. You might know when I'm upset and my tone gets sharp, but my kids and my family are gonna see it a whole lot more than you are. Doesn't mean I'm being incongruent, it's just they are in further into my heart. They're let, I've let them in further into the deeper recesses of my heart. Um, the key is don't be fake. Oh, and I wrote down here another word, trauma. I've never put that down before. For those of you who have a lot of trauma in your life, it tends to intensify your temperament. Um, it's just going to make things more intense your strengths and your weaknesses. Trust that you have emotional triggers after a trauma. Even okay. if you've been healed by the Lord, your body stores trauma and there are physiological reactions to triggers. So you have to be so acutely aware of your own trauma that when somebody says something and you feel yourself want to run or fight or disagree with them, You've got to allow the Lord into that place because it's one thing to say, okay, I know that I've been traumatized in this way by people calling me Jezebel, number one, uh, that makes my triggers flare, but I have to not let that, I have to be aware of my emotional responses, but also knowing what the truth is and what scripture says so I conduct myself according to scripture and I do not let my emotions direct my words and actions. Is this concept has been around since the time of Hippocrates and Socrates, ancient Greek philosophers, and they've and it's been studied ever since. And there's all kinds of science behind it and validity studies. There are different types of assessments that measure this. And it, Hippocrates noticed that people tended to behave in certain patterns and thought in similar ways, and so they came up with these four temperaments. <clears throat> Some of the models will have 16 or 8. They break it down into even more, subdivide it. But at the core, there's four primary temperaments. In some cases, you'll hear Latin words in here. They might use colors, numbers, clinical terms. 
I've been trained in a number of the assessments, but I use the animals because people remember the animals. That's why if you've been around anybody who's been in any of my trainings, they'll talk about beavers and lions and golden retrievers. It's also the model put out by John Trent, who is a Christian author. Many churches have done his teaching and training. Uh, so what I want you to understand before we start is we all have all four of these in us, but you have them to different measure. What people see when you walk into a room is your strongest temperament. They see your strongest one and your weakest one. And for people who are empathic, intuitive, prophetic, discerning, they see this stuff much quicker than everybody else. None of them are good or bad, better or worse. They are judgment free. They describe tendencies of behavior and thought. This is a tool. There are people in every group who sit there and say to me, I don't like this. Uh, I do not like being labeled. And that immediately tells me their temperament. <laughs> um, but the fact is we are a world of labels. I might say it has a tan sweater on. I'm afraid saying the wrong color. Um, <laughs> okay, <laughs> there's probably some other subtle color in there. Uh, or it has gray hair. Those are labels. But we're also living in a society that's trying to erode all types of labels. And say so you can be anything you want to be. Yes. And nobody can argue with you. <laughs> <laughs> so. John can get a wig. Yes. <laughs> this is a tool, and it is a powerful tool for those that grasp it. It made so much sense, and I got introduced to this when my kids were little because I thought my kids were going to be like me, and I thought the things that interested me would interest them. And that the way I responded to things would be the way they responded, and they didn't. And I was really struggling with in junior high and her homework. And she wanted the radio going and the TV on, and she wanted to hum, and she wanted to pen to do this while she's tapping her foot. <laughs> Drove me crazy. I'd say, sit at this table, turn the noise off. But she would get so upset with me and she'd say, I can't, I can't. And I was driving down the interstate one day, listening to Focus on the Family, and this woman came on who'd written a book, The Way They Learn. And I bought it and that just opened my eyes to so many things. I spent years getting more and more training and certifications and assessments. Uh, this will help you with children if you have them at home. It will help you in your marriage. It will help you understand yourself. Yes, co-workers. Uh, before you start putting labels on everybody else, so make sure you recognize yourself. And I'm going to tell you, when I was trained in a lot of these, especially for corporate settings, they said the most important thing was you go in and you only speak in positives and superlatives. You don't say negatives. That's boring. But you're going to get negatives today, too. <laughs> <laughs> I just learned that I'm going to be real about the things you do well Mm -hmm. and the things and areas where you struggle. But the key is I'm not going to put a label on any of you. I'm going to tell you about these animals and then you're going to decide where you fit. And then we'll ask the room if they agree with you <coughs> for those that know you. Um, and I understand not everybody knows everybody in this room. So they all have strengths. They all have weaknesses. They're all motivated by different things. They all have different fears and they all viewed Jesus differently. And so when we talk about the problem of unity in the church, nobody ever talks about this. If you've got four subsets of people that all view Jesus differently, do you think there's going to be some disunity from time to time? Absolutely. If you could draw a line across the top and all of you folks do whatever I'm doing here and a line across the bottom, and on the top, we're going to write the word slower. And on the bottom, we're going to write the word faster. So golden retrievers and beavers. 
These are people who tend to talk slow, move slow, think slow, process information slow, and make decisions slow. They don't want to be rushed. They don't want to be pushed. They want time to think things through. Otters and lions, on the other hand, talk fast, move fast, think fast, process information fast, and make decisions fast, and they'll worry about the details later. <laughs> and these people down here really irritate the people on the top. And the people on the top are saying, would you just slow down and let's do this right the first time? Let's, could we talk about it? Could we think it through? Could we come up with a plan so you don't run off? And... I have to find a different word since this is being recorded. Um, <laughs> do a poor job. <laughs> so how many in here would consider yourself slower? Raise your hands. Okay. How many are fasters? Okay. We have a few more fasters in the room. The next word at the top, you're going to write the word sequential. And at the bottom, you're going to write the word random. Golden retrievers and beavers love policies, rules, poli uh, rules, policies, procedures, protocols, lists, Order. timelines, objectives, goals. They Order. do not like Steps. disorganization. They like things orderly and structured. They like to follow steps A, B, C, D, E. Yep. Yep. They do not want surprises. They do not like risk. The two on the bottom are <coughs> random people. These are your squirrel people. These are people that have a very hard time staying focused. I just gave you a clue as I'm standing here teaching but trying to find something in my book. <laughs> the two on the bottom uh, tend to have like 10 different things going through their head at any given time on a merry-go-round. And if they don't say it right now, it's going to fall out and they're going to forget. So they may find themselves, you might, these are the people that cut you off and talk over you. <laughs> and it's not because they think their words are more important. It's like, I got to grab that right now because it's going to be gone. Sometimes if you see me writing in a meeting, it's because I got to grab that thing and write it down because it's not appropriate to blurt that out right now in the middle of this meeting, but I want to remember to come back to it. Um, I can tell if somebody's sequential or random by looking at their purse, looking at their vehicle, looking at their office, looking at their kitchen. Golden retrievers and beavers have nice little neat places for everything. Everything's put away. There's place for everything and everything has its place. Otters and lions are known as pile people. They have piles everywhere. They don't put their laundry away. They don't close drawers all the way. They don't close cupboards. Their closet doors stay open. They need to see their stuff. And these people down here look very disorganized, undisciplined, and lazy to these people <coughs> up here. And these people up here just want to say you need to get things together and listen pay attention and just there's an orderly way to do this they don't understand how these people's brains work <laughs> i pile people they have their own organization system but these people don't understand it so when these people if you're a boss and you walk into your random person's office and say where is that report where are those numbers i needed how are you going to find it in this pig pile and these people are going to say stay out of my stuff what do you want i will get it for you and they're going to go right over to their pile and pull it out because they know where their stuff is um how many of you are more sequential that's your preference raise your hand up high so we can all see you okay quite a few of you how many of you are more random put your hands up high don't be ashamed okay yeah. If you are not certain, if you're confused in any of these, put a question mark by both words. That means you could go either way. And we're going to narrow in on it. The two up top are punctual. The two on the bottom are tardy. <laughs> now, what I want you to do is think about what feels right to you. And what you were like as a kid because you may have been raised by parents who were late all the time 
while well, you wanted to be on time. You may be a kid who struggled with time, but your parents were very regimented about being on time. And so you always feel like you're failing and getting somewhere. The two on the top, golden retrievers and beavers, believe that if you're not 15 minutes early for something, then you're late. And if you are late, there's no excuse for that. That is the rudest thing you can do to somebody. Don't you ever be late. It's not acceptable. The two on the bottom, no matter how hard they try, they're coming in on two wheels right on the dot, or they're five to 10 minutes late, and they're flustered, and they're mad at themselves, and they just either want to explain to everybody in the room why they were late, or they just want everybody to leave them alone until they can calm themselves down. Don't talk to me, just give me a minute. And these people are usually shamed by these people. Because when these people come in all flustered and late, there's one of these standing at the door doing this, <laughs> rolling their eyes, huffing or puffing, and they just have to let you know that they've been waiting for you. And you know, the meeting started 10 minutes ago. And what was the excuse today? You need to get up a little earlier. You need to make a little more time. They've got all the answers for these folks. And I remember, I'm going to give you clues, but in case you didn't know, this is me. Um, and I remember teaching this and one woman, the whole room was, uh, these <laughs> folks. <laughs> and one woman said, Nancy, why do you choose to be late? <laughs> yeah, right. Nancy, and yeah. I teach all the time. Everything's a choice. And that really flummoxed me. Mm -hmm. I had to think about it. I said, what? She said, why do you choose to be late? <laughs> And I said, well, I've never thought of it as choosing to be late. Because um, I know what it does inside to me. And medically, and I'm not using it as an excuse, and scientifically, these people have been proven through science to suffer from time blindness. And they're also known as frustrated perfectionists because they believe they can get one more thing in. I just got to get this done. They also, you're going to find that a lot of these folks have ADD and ODD diagnoses. And they have, they have a very difficult time stopping this to transition to this. So it, there's a lot about the brain that's involved here. Uh, I'm married to a husband who likes to be 15 minutes early. And this was a major issue in our marriage starting out. We finally get to the point where we just take separate cars places <laughs> most of the time because I'm going to visit and want to leave, hang around at the end. He wants to be done, whatever it is. As soon as they say we're dismissed, he's out the door. Um, he wants to go sit there early. Uh, I've got stuff I'm trying to do to get out the door. Very different ways of thinking and processing. How many of you are punctual by nature and that is your desire? Hands way up. Okay, quite a few of you. How many tend to be tardy? Hands way up. Okay, it's about even. Um, so put your check mark there. The two at the top tend to be the introverts and the two at the bottom tend to be the extroverts. <coughs> if you had to go to a company function, either at your employer or your spouse's employer and you go there's a lot of people and you don't know the people are you going to work the room and talk to everybody at the refreshment table even if you don't remember their names you're going to speak to everybody <clears throat> or are you going to go find one or two people you know and sit with them all night that's a clue if you came into a doctor's office and you're sitting in the lobby and there's only one other person in the lobby. Are you going to strike up a conversation with them? Or are you going to ignore them and be silent? Those are ways to tell if you're more of an extrovert or an introvert. Okay. Now, I have people say, I'm not an extrovert because people drain me. Extroverts get drained because, um, we're going to get to it, but they carry emotional intelligence they feel everything, they read everything, and they know how to normalize a room. <clears throat> but it takes stuff out of them. And I used to have an office manager who said to me, 
Nancy, how come you look forward to some clients coming in and you dread other clients coming in? It's because there are those who don't suck the life out of me. And then there are those that do. And they don't even have to open their mouth or say anything. They can just be standing there looking at me. And I can just feel suck the yes, energy yes. out of me. So you can be an extrovert, but you still need to pull away to get replenished and recharged because you've been around too many people. That doesn't mean you're an introvert. It just means you need to recharge. Okay, the last thing to write on the top is impatient with people. And at the bottom, you're going to write impatient with things or situations. And this is what this looks like. Let's say you had a rough day at work and you're late getting home and you just want to order a pepperoni pizza, pick it up and go home, put your feet up, get comfortable and eat your pizza and quiet. You get home and you get settled and you find out the idiot at the pizza store gave you a hamburger and pineapple pizza. Why couldn't they just pay attention? Why did they have to ruin my night and give me this thing? And there are people who will immediately get in the car and go back and give them a piece of their mind, or they will call them and give them a piece of their mind and demand a refund uh, because they think, how hard is it to pay attention when I give an order? Um, the two at the bottom, when I say they get impatient with things or situations, which would bother you more? The pizza, the idiot that couldn't get your pizza order straight or losing your keys? Losing my keys. Thousand percent. Who says losing their keys? Okay. Who says the idiot with the pizza order? <laughs> Just a few of those. Okay. If you're if you're confused on some of them, there's a reason why, and I will explain that in a minute. Um, which is going to bother you more? Let's say you got to get to an appointment, and you're rate right on time but there's an old fart in the road in front of you who won't drive the speed limit and you can't get around him. Hey. Um, <laughs> is that going to make you mad? Are you muttering in your car? You need to get off the road if you can't drive the speed limit. No, they or your remote not working. Which one's gonna bother you more? Remote. 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 Okay, who says the remote not working? Who says the old person that won't get out of the way? Okay. Okay. All right. Now, on this side, the beaver and the lion side, we're going to write one word, work. And on the golden retriever and otter side, we're going to write the word people. Oh, I got to talk fast. Um, yeah, but... <laughs> um, Beavers and lions are very task oriented. They're all about the work they've got to get done. Golden retrievers and otters are all about people and relationships. So this is what this looks like. Let's say you all live in Presque Isle, but you've got a good friend, Sally, who lives in Bangor, but you don't get to see Sally very often because you have full weeks with work, school, kids, family. But one Saturday, you find yourself in Bangor on Saturday morning at 10.30, and you say, I'm going to go over and see if Sally's got time for a cup of coffee. And you go over and knock on the door. Hey, I was in town, just wondered if you had time for a cup of coffee. If she is a beaver or a lion, she's going to look at you and be really happy to see you. But then she's going to look at her watch and say, you know, I would love to, but I've got to get to the bank before it closes at noon. And I've got a whole bunch of errands that have to be done today. So I'm sorry, I can't. But listen, I'm going to be up your way on Thursday. Do you want to get for lunch, together for lunch on Thursday? Sally is not going to put aside her plans to accommodate your impromptu, spontaneous drop-in visit. She needs to schedule you, plan you in, and make time for you. If Sally were a golden retriever or an otter and you did the same thing, landed on her door, hey, I'm just in town, she's going to do the same thing. Look at her watch and say, I'd love to, but i got things to do. This is the only day I've got to do it. Well, you know what? The heck with it. I'll do it on my lunch break Monday. That's what I'll do. I can take care of it then. And you're going to say, are you sure? Are you sure? Yes, yes. Come on in. I'll put the coffee pot on. Now, I want to know which you would do. And I have many people say, well, I'm going to invite her in because I was taught not to be rude. But I'm probably going to be sitting, looking at my watch under the table and wondering how long is she going to be here because I get stuff to get done. 
If you think that way, you belong on the work side. So with that definition, how many of you are more task oriented, work oriented? Hands way up, please. Okay, quite a few of you. Uh, how about the people side? You'd stop what you were doing and invite them in. You should have check marks across the top or the bottom. Who has mostly theirs across the top? How about the bottom? Why? Because you already know this? I didn't under, you didn't make any check marks, but I didn't see it. Oh, yeah. I wanted you, you to put check marks by the ones that mostly you. And then you should have a check mark on the left or the right. Um, all right. Let's talk about the animals quickly. Golden retrievers, what do you know about their attributes and their traits? Golden retrievers are faithful, loyal, dependable, true blue. They are not dogs to put outside. They want to be with you. Mm -hmm. They want to sit right beside you. They want to look at you all the time. They suck energy out of you. They basically saying, pat me, pat me, pay attention to me. Tell me you love me. That's what these people are like, but they're not bad dogs. They're very good dogs. I'm going to give you a P word for each of these temperaments. The P word for golden retrievers is peaceful. These are the peaceful ones among us. You can write that in their box underneath their name. And then above their name, these are the natural born worker bees of any home, school, church, or organization. Worker bees. These are not leaders, these are followers. We need these folks. These are the people that actually get the work done. And when I say they're peaceful, they don't want to get caught up in drama, politics, red tape, gossip. These are not your conspiracy theorists. They just want to take things at its face value. Uh, they, if they went to church and the pastor ran off with the organist, they don't want to hear about it. They, if somebody runs up to goes, do you hear what happened this week? No, I don't want to hear about that. I don't want to gossip. They're going to show up and sit in the pew their family sat in for 40 years and trust that somebody's mm -hmm. going to lead them in a song and somebody's going to read a passage of scripture. Mm -hmm. And they don't need to know anything else. Mm -hmm. They are very patient people. They will do whatever you ask them. It will be done on time. It will be done correctly. Uh, don't give them any surprises. They are not spontaneous. Do not ask them to make decisions. They hate making decisions because they're afraid they're going to get in trouble or they'll make the wrong one. They are people who grow up in one town, live there their entire life, go to college in the closest town, go to work for an employer close to their hometown where they will work for their entire career and retire with that company and they will probably buy the house they grew up in or the house next to mom and dad's. Um, these are not chitty chatters. They're not talkers. You will, a big clue of whether you're dealing with a golden retriever is you have to draw everything out of them. They don't really know how to go back and forth with conversation. They'll just sit, they just like being with you. Um, these are the visitors of the crowd. These are people that love to visit and have friends. They are not, they don't like big circles of friends. They like small circles of friends. Intimate friends that they've had for many years and they value routine predictability. They are the people that have beans every Saturday night and lasagna every Tuesday. And they invite the same couple over every Sunday after church, the same two couples. Very patient. Their greatest fear, and if you want to see a golden retriever get riled up, is change. They do not like change. And that's when you'll start to see them get a little snippety. So if you're supervising golden retrievers and you go to them and say, I got to change your morning break from nine to 10, they're going to get very upset and say, you can't do that because if I take a break at 10, I won't be hungry at 11 when I go to lunch. And the supervisor is going to say, I don't know what you're going to do. Just don't eat on your break. But they are very scheduled. You'll, 
pretty yes. simple. You find these folks working in factory settings where they can stay on task for a long time and do the same thing over and over and over. They love it. They go to work, work a 10 hour schedule, go home and be with their family and they're just energized. They also do a lot of data entry and set in cubicles and just key information all day looking at computer screens. You will also find golden retrievers working as elementary school teachers. And they're really into artsy craftsy things. <laughs> Embroidery, making wreaths. <clears throat> so their greatest fear of a golden retriever is change. So what do you think the last five years has done to a golden retriever? <laughs> and they're slightly on edge, crispy. <laughs> yeah, they're taking meds, yes. <laughs> Let's move on to beavers. I could spend hours talking to you about beavers, but I won't. So beavers, let me tell you about these folks. But they take on big projects, right? Yes. Like... I've had a lot of people say to me they make a mess and their beaver dams are a mess, but actually their beaver dams are engineering marvels. Yeah. I, we have They're some... very strategic. Yeah. Big they are projects. very dedicated. I've talked to fishermen who say they're going down the stream and they come up on a beaver dam and there's beavers spread around the dam working mm -hmm. on their part and they slap their tail on the water as if to say, get out of here, mm -hmm. we're busy. Yep. <laughs> um, that's what these people are like. The P word for a beaver is perfect. These are the perfect ones among us. And at the top, you're gonna write the word manager. These are the managers of any homeschool, church or organization. <coughs> beavers are very smart people and they know they're smart. So I tell folks, do not argue with a beaver unless you know what you're talking about because they will slice you and dice you. Um, and they usually don't open their mouth and say anything unless they're sure of what they're saying. You will find beavers working, they have a depth of expertise in their area of interest. So whatever they do, they have studied it to the nth degree and they know it inside and out. So you will find beavers in a lot of financial accounting roles, CPAs. You will find it in the medical field, EMTs, nurses, doctors, surgeons. And the more specialized they are, the more of a beaver they are. Uh, all of your tradesmen, plumbers, carpenters, electricians. Hmm. Um, engineers. Engi every oh, engineer sorry. is a beaver. Every engineer. <laughs> <laughs> Lawyers, uh, your high school and college teachers, people who specialize in a certain the academics. area. Yeah. The academics, yeah. Um, when the pastor runs off with the organist, it's the beavers in the church who are going to jump to and come up with a plan and say, okay, could you take the offering? Do you want to read scripture? Could you find three hymns for us? And they're going to put people in place. Right and make sure the church service goes on right. while somebody's doing damage control somewhere else. Problem solved. Um, they know it needs to be done. That's, that's what makes them good EMTs and crisis response people. Okay. Because when everybody else is running or frozen, they're running in and go, okay, here, 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 here. Um, <laughs> very smart. These people don't buy anything unless they've researched it on Consumer Reports and read every Google review oh that God. exists. <laughs> And they can suffer from analysis paralysis because if you say, have you made up your mind yet? Or what did you decide about this? They're going to say, well, wait, I got to check one more place. Or I wanted to talk to so-and-so. And these people need a kick in the rear sometimes because they can get bogged down in getting more information because they do not want to make a mistake. A lot of perfectionists in this group. A lot of perfectionists, they're hard on themselves, they're hard on everybody else. They tend to be pessimistic. They're going to see what's wrong with a situation before they see what's right with it. Um, because of that, they tend to be very smart. They tend to be negative, critical, judgmental, nitpickers, lecturers, and nobody can ever quite attain their standard that they're looking for. Beavers suffer depression more than any of the other temperaments because they're so hard on themselves and they're hard on everybody else. <clears throat> and their greatest fear is failure. 
or being blamed for something. And they have a very hard time admitting when they're wrong and a very hard time apologizing. And so I have to tell all the beavers of the world, you will be wrong. You've been wrong before, you will be wrong again, and you better learn how to apologize. Because the more you do it, the less likely you are to be so adamant in your opinion and dogmatic. These are your intellectuals. They process everything from the neck up. They make decisions with their head. It has to be logical, factual, analytical, scientific. Beavers live... These are your control freaks of all the temperaments. Okay. Uh, they live with a very tightly controlled box of how the world should be. There's a right way and a wrong way to do things. And if we would all just do what we're supposed to do, we won't have any problems. Just follow along. Oh, yeah, when I was telling you about the types of people that are here, the careers, this is also your military and law enforcement folks. Chain of command, hierarchical who do I report to? Who reports to me? Everybody stay in line, get in place. Don't cause any friction. Okay. Golden Retrievers are rule followers. These are rule enforcers. Yeah. These are the people who are going to tell you at work, you know that's against the dress code that you've got flip-flops on. We're not supposed to wear those. Uh, you're not supposed to wear spaghetti straps. Mm -hmm. That's a beaver. Okay. You know, we started five minutes ago. Um, <coughs> They're always pointing out, pointing out. They can't help themselves. I'm married to one of these. They play little mind games. And he knows I use this for an example, yes. But they have these little mind games that they play with people. And one day my husband called me into the living room. I got home coming and carrying things. And he's sitting in the recliner in front of the TV. He'd get home for me. Nancy, come here for a minute. I hate being summoned, by the way. Um, I went in and I said, What? He said, look out there under the kitchen table. Do you see that uh, soda cap on the floor? I said, yes. He said, that's been there three weeks. I was just wondering how long it was going to be there before you swept the floor. And I, I looked at him and said, yeah. I said, you know what? I haven't even seen that. I don't care if it's there another three weeks. I'm more concerned by the fact that you've been watching it and didn't go out there and clean it up yourself. <laughs> right. And it's like you're setting up this little trap for me to see if I pass your test or not. And now that I failed it, you need to give me a lesson. Oh, well, that's the other thing. Beavers, when they want you to get a lesson, oh, because they have this tightly controlled box and they're pretty sure they're right about everything, and they often are right, they have very little tolerance for people who disagree with them. And if you disagree with them, then you're wrong. There's really no consideration that they might need to compromise. Um, yeah, I just gotta stop. <laughs> I'm just saying, I can go You're on. passionate about beavers, aren't you? I am passionate about it because the church is filled with them and they're very judgmental. Yes. <laughs> and they do more damage because they don't understand what God put in them. They're smart, they're articulate. These would be your public speakers. But perhaps a little rigid, and that's where the problem is. Rigid, yes. Okay. They also have a very hard time expressing emotions. They only know from the neck up. Mm -hmm. If you ask them what they feel, they don't know. No. Um, they just see a problem, what do I have to do to solve this? These are mostly the people that come to me for counseling. They're perennial students. They're always trying to learn to be better. Okay, this, we got this challenge. What do we do? How do we turn this around? They want the steps. We wouldn't get far without them. Right. I tell people, while the rest of us are trying to function, these people are going to rule the world. Because they have five-year goals and plans, and they're working their plan. They, they don't do anything without planning it, and they've thought it through. These are the people that they want to take their family to Disneyland in November. In March, they're going to start planning their agenda and their budget, and it's going to be all down to the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're going to work their plan when they get there. They're not going to waste time. Where they're eating has been all planned out. There, a lot of artists in this group, uh, like I said, intelligent people, they tend to not delegate work. They would rather do it themselves and make sure it gets done correctly. In school, they hated team projects and group projects because they said, I'm going to do the work and the rest of you are going to get credit and you're not going to do squat. They do not trust people. 
They tend to be suspicious of people. Mm -hmm. You have to earn their trust. Mm -hmm. And they believe that everybody, if you give them enough rope, is going to hang themselves. And just watch. <laughs> just watch what's going to happen. And what, if you burn them or betray them, they say they will, you, they will forgive you, but you will be dead to them. You just be dead. You don't exist. They don't have hate for you. You are just dead. And they will be polite if they see you on the street, but you will never get a chance to hurt them again. Um, these golden retrievers are stubborn. Beavers are the most stubborn of all the temperaments. Once they decide on a course and they think it's right, you're not going to talk them out of it. They're not going to get on board with anybody else's. They're going to sit back and say, you guys do what you want. You're going to come back in six months, and I'm going to tell you this. Was, I told you this was going to happen. Okay. They tend to talk a lot. Like, otters. What do you know about them? Lots of friends. Lots of friends. Cute, social. They're friendly and fun unless you confront or threaten their loved ones or them, and then they get vicious really quick. That's what these folks are like. The P word for an otter is the popular one among us. And at the top, they are natural born team builders or encouragers of any organization. Now when I say popular, a lot of people immediately say, that's not me, I'm not popular. I'm not talking about people that get on tabletops and dance at parties. Um, <laughs> I'm not talking about the person with the most friends. These are a lot of the otters have very strong discernment giftings, intuitive, empathic, prophetic giftings. Very, very sharp. These two on the bottom are emotionally intelligent. These two on the top are cognitively intelligent. Our public schools are set up for these students. These people tend to struggle in public schools, even though they're very intelligent, their brain works a different way. And that's why many of these people are getting diagnosed with ADD, and these people are getting diagnosed with ODD, Oppositional Defiant Disorder, and they're getting diagnosed by people up here who are their <coughs> teachers, their therapists, and their doctors. And they're, these people don't have a clue how these people's brains work. It's completely different. Um... So I am all about teaching the otters what to do with what they're picking up intuitively and empathically because you've got to get a bubble around you because people are going to think you're crazy. And these are the people who hear and see in the spirit realm and they don't dare to tell anybody because they're going to get locked in a rubber room by somebody is what they think or they're going to get put on medication. <clears throat> then there are people who don't love Jesus and they're going through this and they think they're crazy so they're either addicted to drugs and alcohol or heavily medicated. Hmm. We're medicating a lot of spiritual activity. Not all of it, but a lot of it. Uh, otters, where I said beavers don't delegate anything, otters will delegate everything to you and make you think it was your idea. <laughs> They'll get you to do their work and you'll think it was your idea. These are the people that might say, hey, we're gonna put a fence up out here and we really need to get it painted. Would you all like to come Saturday? Listen, let's just bring a bag lunch and if I'm an otter, I'm going to be here with the paint. And you come in, I'm going to pass you a paintbrush and your paint can. And I'm going to get you all settled. And I'm going to say, listen, I'm going to go get some donuts and coffee, okay? And I'll be right back. And then I'm going to come back with donuts and coffee. And I'm going to pass them out to chat with her a while. How's life going? And I'm going to move over to that. And you guys are going to have that whole fence painted without me picking up a brush. These are your natural born car salesmen. These are your master manipulators of the world. And they can steer conversation and lead you in a direction that you don't even know you're being led because they read people really, really well. And these people up here think they're so smart because they're so intellectual. And these people down here are leading them around by the nose and they don't even know they're being led. Now, sometimes they do. I do have a few in our household who have this going on. And I remember going through school and she got to college and she couldn't pass this one class. I don't think she cares that I share this. No. Um, we've talked about it before. Basic statistics. And she was always one that would just, these are your charisma people. 
tell a joke, make you laugh, give you a present. You're going to love me, but don't expect anything of me. And so I would go to her parent-teacher meetings, and the teacher would say, yeah, she just doesn't care about government. I can't get her to do anything. I said, then flunk her. She came home with that A that quarter. I went to the teacher, and I said, how did she get an A? Well, she's so darn cute and funny. And, and she made us some brownies, and she fed us, and she sang a silly song she made up. I said, you gave her an A for that? So she went to college, and she couldn't pass this one class. And statistics. Yeah, it was some accounting class. And I remember going to her, her advisor, managerial accounting is what it was. Mm -hmm. oh, really? And I sat with her and her advisor, and it's hard for a parent to do this, but the advisor was right, and the advisor was a strong beaver. And just telling her all the reasons why she did not need managerial accounting to be successful in life. And this beaver advisor looked at her and said, that bullshit doesn't fly here. You're going to do the work everybody else has to do if you want this degree. And it made her mad, but she did it. She said it was the hardest thing she ever did. Interestingly enough, 30 years earlier, I had done the same thing at the university in regard to calculus. And mm. I had an advisor tell me the same thing. Mm. We are not changing the curriculum because you don't want to take calculus. Mm. Otters hate conflict. These people on the side are conflict averse. Beavers and lions, they don't care about conflict. They'll engage because beavers are the smartest people in the room. And lions are the most hard-headed in the room so hey bring it on these two will run from it and withdraw from it otters don't delegate uh, they don't pay attention to details details really bog them down it overwhelms them because they're like a walking sensory sponge they feel everything and so you're asking me to focus on what and it's very hard for them because they're picking up everything um, these folks, I say this with great love and affection, they tend to be very shallow relationally. Everybody's their friend. These are the people that talk to you at Walmart and the grocery store that you've never seen before. Or if you're an otter, people will tell you everything. Because <laughs> you're just the type of person that makes people feel comfortable and they want to talk to you. Um, they have really no, no uh, filter about relationships. Everybody's their new best friend. They only get interested in things they're passionate about, like stop clubbing the baby seal or march of dimes walk for life or habitat for humanity. Um, for, with my otter for years, it was build orphanages in Africa. They're, they get on some kick and that's their passion and their interest. If they're not interested in something, they don't care about it, don't want to hear about it, don't want to be involved. Um, not stubborn, but these people will tend to ghost you. And they are not very consistent and they will not follow through on their word in general, unless the Holy Spirit comes in and tempers them. Beavers are going to follow through on their word. If they tell you they're going to do something, it'll be done and they will be there. Otters, it all depends on whether they get a better offer between now and then. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, and I've had a lot of people do that to me, stand me up when I was co-presenters in meetings that just decided they didn't want to come that day because, yeah, I had a chance to go shopping in Bangor. Uh, you have half of a conference I'm supposed to present. I couldn't believe that. That's an otter. Um, and if you confront them, they will deny it. But if you back them into a corner, they will get very vicious with their mouths. And they will say cruel, hurtful things to get you to shut up. Stop holding me accountable. Don't make me answer this. I don't want to talk about this. Their greatest fear is rejection and worrying what everybody thinks of them. They're very image conscious. Conscious. Lions, what do you know about them? They roar, they're alphas. They're Solitary. kings of the jungle. I hear a lot of people say, well, that depends. Are you talking about the female lion or the male lion? <laughs> yeah, right. Um, they are different animals. Or yeah, have different. Throw it out. <laughs> but <laughs> often what I hear is they're bullies, they're mean, they're full of themselves, they're arrogant, they think they're all that, they're scary, <clears throat> intimidating, fierce. Those are usually things said by people who are not lions. <laughs> lions are the powerful ones among us. And they're the natural born leaders of any home, school, church, or organization. You will know if you're in the room with a lion 
because the atmosphere changes when they come in the room. You will feel them come in. And whatever mood they're in comes in the room with them. And they don't even have to say a word. They have the, uh, the ability to clear a whole room without saying anything or to encourage and energize a whole room without saying anything. They are very intense people. And often they have no idea how they're impacting people in their home, at their workplace, at their school. Um, even when they're trying to not be so intense, it's very hard for them. People love them or hate them. There's no in between. You can't just ignore a lion. Regardless of what you think of him, Trump is a lion. And I have a lot of people say, oh, I want to be that. I want to be one of those. You don't want to be one of those if you weren't wired to be one of those because these people take a lot of hits and they get rocks thrown at them a lot. But and it's they bleed and it still hurts, but they have the ability to get up and do this and keep putting one foot in front of the other. Um, they're greatly misunderstood because people are often intimidated by them. These are the, the beavers are the most stubborn of the temperaments, the lions are the most strong willed of the temperaments. Do not tell them they can't do something because then you've just thrown down the gauntlet and they're just going to have to go prove you wrong. Oh, they tend to be loners. They're not, they don't fit well on teams. Where beavers are in the box, lions are out of the box. And they're always thinking up new and inventive ways of doing things. They see things that other people don't see. They're visionaries. They're motivators. When they say something, the people that are listening to them believe them. If they say, I see this and it's going to happen, a lot of the beavers will say, yeah, right. You're just a blowhard just for now. But a lot of people are looking for it. If anybody can make that happen, this person's going to make that happen. Um, they are not mean, but they can be fierce when needed. Because they carry such intensity and a natural authority, if they are not tempered by the Holy Spirit, they can be jerks. Um, and they just plow over people. I have seen a lot of lions over the years that say, yeah, this is me. And I could run my workplace better than my boss and they're idiots and this is what I would do and this and this. And they don't understand why they haven't been promoted. But what I tell the lions is just because you have leadership ability doesn't mean you get to lead because you may not have the skills and experience. You may not have the integrity or the respect of people. You have to earn the right to lead especially in God's house. In God's house, you lead by serving first. Right. And it's still servant leadership once he puts you in a leadership role. Um, when lions are part of a family or an organization, these are the people that walk into a room and if you're having a meeting, these are the people that go, well, why does this have to happen? Or how come, or what if, they're always challenging the status quo. <laughs> and these people who are usually in charge and managing are saying, could you sit down and just do what we asked you to do and stop causing problems? If we want you to talk, we'll ask for your opinion. Um, Would these be the choleric? Yes. That denomination? Choleric. So you got phlegmatic, melancholy, sanguine, choleric, in case you're familiar with those terms. Lions have followers. If you don't have followers, you're probably not a lion. And when I mean followers, they could be following at a distance because you're kind of scary to be around or I don't want to be near you when they start throwing rocks. <laughs> uh, you go take those hits yourself. Mm -hmm. But wherever they go, they're change agents for the kingdom. And so they stir things up. They don't even have to talk. Things just manifest and get provoked and stirred up. And if they're not seasoned by the Holy Spirit, they can just like change for change's sake. So they can go in and just cause problems by opening their mouth and challenging, always challenging. Mm -hmm. and, and there are times they need to sit down and be quiet. So golden retrievers, their greatest fear is change. Beavers, their greatest fear is failure. Otters, their greatest fear is rejection. Lions, their greatest fear is having no voice. If they're not allowed to speak, lions don't care if you do what they say. They just want to be able to say it. 
They want their opinion asked. And when nobody wants to hear from them and says, sit down, when we want your opinion, we'll give it to you. That's gonna make them feel like their chest is going to explode. Yeah. These are your entrepreneurs, people who are out building ministries, churches, and businesses. These people do not start their own businesses because there are these are risk averse up here. These people don't mind risk. Beavers would prefer to go into an existing structure and work under the umbrella in their own area of manage, management. Lions want to build something that's never been seen before and never been done before. So I'm going to stop there because there's a lot more that could be said. <clears throat> but what I'd like to know are what you think your top two are. Now, I'm going to say this. <clears throat> when I've taken these trainings, they always said you could have a combination like this, like this, like this, and like this. But that you would never see a golden retriever lion mix because these are leaders, these are followers. Golden retrievers tend to run from lions. And that you would never see a beaver otter mix because these are your perfectionists and these are your more disorganized folks. But I see this mix all the time. Mm -hmm. and, I was going to uh, say, I think Lee is otter and beaver, for example. Yeah, that's why you say I can see yeah. both parts of him. Uh, mm -hmm. There is, I want to make sure I give you the scripture for this because I want to say something. I want to say this before somebody identifies as this. <coughs> if you are a lion-beaver mix, uh, there's just one word that is most frequently used for them. And that is asshole. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> and I say that when I do this training in businesses and they laugh and they all look at the person in the room. And I was going to give you the scripture... In Genesis 49, 15, I'm going to support that comment. Issachar is a strong ass. So <laughs> Numbers 22, 28, the Lord opened the mouth of the ass. Second Peter 2, 16, the dumb ass spoke with the voice of a man. Now, just for the record, that's an example of somebody twisting scripture to make a point. But I said, give me some scriptures, Lord, to back that up. Right. All right. <laughs> um, <clears throat> These people struggle with interpersonal skills and relationships. And they often don't understand why nobody wants to hang out with them and nobody wants to be my friend. And why are you all so, such wimps and so crybabies and sensitive? You can't even handle anything because they're just like bull in a china shop. And they just leave a wake of destruction around them. All oh, these lions, they say things that nobody else will say. Um, and then they take the hits for it, but there's usually people behind them saying, thank you for saying that. Mm -hmm. When you tell me your pairs, and we're going to find out what your top two are, and then their combinations, and I have examples in scripture for each one of the combos. There are, if we look for primary and secondary, there are 12 possible combinations. And I tell all the perfectionists and the beavers in the room, there is only one perfect person and you are in it. So get rid of this perfection standard. Perfectionism is a sin. God calls us to excellence. If you say, if somebody's an otter first and you criticize them or engage in conflict with them, they're going to let loose with their mouth because it's going to sting them so much. Mm -hmm. And they're going to feel it so deeply. A lion's going to stand there and take it and let you give your best shot. And then when you're done, they're going to have something to say and they will crush you. Mm -hmm. um, beavers are going to talk you to death and tell you why you're wrong, your opinion's wrong. Mm -hmm. And they're not gonna lose sleep over it because they know they're <laughs> right. Golden retrievers are just going to look disappointed in you and walk away. Um, so you, you parent children very differently. If you're parenting a lion, they got to be given a choice. So a mother who says to her little lion child, get in your room and clean that mess because you're not having any supper until it's clean. They won't eat for three days. They don't care. They're going to prove to you that you can't make them clean that room. It's hard with parenting too. If you say, little lion, go in there and clean your room, uh, you can either hang your clothes up and make your bed or you can sweep the floor and organize your bookcase. 
now they have a choice and they have some power and they feel like they're part of the decision making they're going to go do it but if you lock them in like beavers will do and say you will do this uh they're going to buck you every step of the way and if you're a parent on the top a golden retriever or a beaver and you're raising children on the bottom who are on the bottom you're going to cause your child anxiety and depression if you are <laughs> yeah if you are a parent on the bottom who's raising a child on the top you're going to cause them anxiety and depression i could see that yep okay so i had to go back to my kids and apologize to them when i learned all this and i said i am so sorry I thought you would enjoy the same things I did. And I said, Mom, you drove us crazy. <laughs> she said, I like to be early. And you were always waking us up at the last minute, throwing us in the car with wet hair and a comb and a piece of toast and saying, hurry, 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 we're going to be late. <laughs> and on the weekends, I thought I knew what I was doing my, with my Saturday. And you would wake us up and say, oh, we're going to have an adventure today, something new. And she said, and you thought that was so much fun. <laughs> That was not fun for me. That caused me so much stress. And I try to teach the parents. You cannot make a golden retriever lead. And I keep saying, you're going to regret this if you don't get control of this kid. The reason it's important for you to know your first two, and I'd ask you to just go before the Lord with this, because when we talk about fivefold ministry at the next meeting, it's going to be critical. And my greatest struggle in ministry and in business is when somebody is convinced that they fit here, but that is not the fruit that's manifesting. Mm. And so there are a lot of people that tell me they're a prophet, and they're not. They might have a gift for prophetic ministry, but that's different than being a prophet. Right. Or somebody who thinks they're a teacher, and they're not. And if you're not open to being challenged, um, it can really hinder your ability to thrive in the kingdom, what God has planned for you. Because when you're turned loose in your gifting and your call, it's powerful and it feels good and the whole body benefits. Um, when we come next time, I'm going to start with how your temperament affects your relationship with God, specifically in regard to Bible study, in regard to prayer, and in regard to trusting God, and in regard to your spiritual gifts, because each of the temperaments tends to operate in different spiritual gifts, and the fivefold ministry is represented differently here. Um, Can you give us an appetizer on that to kind of ponder? Just read time? Ephesians 4. And then when you read about, and he gave the church some apostles, prophets, shepherds, evangelists, mm -hmm. teachers, or whatever the order they go in. Um, you might want to just Google or do some research on what each of those roles and functions looks like. Let me, let me close in prayer. <clears throat> and we'll do it again in two weeks. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for this time to come together and to discover what your plans are for your body. I thank you, Lord, that you have created one body with all these parts. And Lord, help us to understand who you created us to be. Just like Jeremiah, you have put something in each of us. There's a message and a word that only we can deliver. And even if it is the same word, we have very diverse styles and methods. And there are ears that need to hear from me, that need to hear from Dawn, that need to hear from Chelsea. And they're all different people. So Lord, equip us for the task ahead Continue to teach us as we humble ourselves and consider your word. Lord, when we open your word next time and look at examples in scripture of these temperaments, and then look to what the writer of Ephesians tells us about the gifts and the functions you've given to the church and why you've given them and how long you've given them. It wasn't for a season, it's till Christ returns so that we could grow up into the full stature as a mature body of believers. So, Lord, have your way in this group. I thank you for this group uh, this, on the screen. We pray for protection and blessing as people dive in to your word and draw closer to you, Lord. We just ask for your continued watch care over them and their households. We thank you for all of this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Amen.